Havana Motor Club follows the underground drag racing community in, in Cuba and their quest to have the first official car race there since the revolution. And uh, we decided to follow many different characters because we felt each one represented a different perspective on how Cuba is changing today and also how Cubans themselves are responding to these changes. And so we have four main racers, uh, one who's the sort of the all the patriotic Cuban who comes from a family of mechanics and they don't have many resources to outside things um, but they're able to invent what they can't acquire um, from abroad and their biggest rivals is this guy who has a lot of access to outside resources um, mostly through a man in Miami who provides him with not only car parts but even a Porsche that he was able to bring in uh, to Cuba and giving him an unfair advantage, but what he has in resources, he sort of lacks in innovation. And we felt that rivalry was a very interesting uh, portrait of, of the U.S.'s relationship to Cuba now and, and, and what the future holds for Cuba in light of Obama's uh, new, new changes uh, to Cuba and, and our new relationship with Cuba. Um, and then there's two other characters who represent other perspectives of life in Cuba. One is a fierce patriot also, um, but he's, he's very openly critical of the revolution, even though he's, he, he feels his life was saved because of the revolution. Um, he has cancer and uh, he, he got great health care as a result of the health care system in Cuba. And, and he loves his country. He, he never wants to leave it, but he's also you know, very critical of, of certain things, which I think is a normal thing in Cuba with the revolution, which is always supposed to be evolving. So he's, you know, he loves it, but he wants th certain things to change. And then our fourth character, Tur, um, he sort of rejected the changes in Cuba and he feels the changes are, are really hurting him. And he's been trying to leave Cuba through various means uh, for several years. And, uh, and he's, a, he's an incredible racer, but he's also really dissatisfied with things in Cuba. So you see him preparing for the race with this car that he, he really created from not only the bottom up, but from the ocean floor up because he was able to find this boat motor that he converted into a, a very powerful engine. And, uh, and ironically, he's been trying to leave on a boat. So uh, he, he represents the Cuban who wants more outside of Cuba rather than through these changes coming to Cuba. Um, so we felt those characters did show a varied perspective on life in Cuba today, uh, particularly in light of the, the new changes. It's really an incredible story and you're, you're so close up with the characters. It's just wonderful to, to, to enjoy the film and, and to watch how it all, you know, kind of works itself out. Can you talk a little bit about how you got the idea to make this film? Where, how did you find this story? What, how long did it take you to do it? I mean, it seems like an, an amazing accomplishment during the time that you were able to make it. Well, with many of my films, the story sort of finds me more than I find it. And um, I had originally gone to Cuba. Well, first I was supposed to go to Cuba to study abroad during college. And two weeks before the trip, uh, the Elian Gonzalez thing happened, and they canceled all American visas to Cuba just for a small period, but it was right during when I was supposed to study there. And that really piqued my interest in this country that was so close to the US, but completely off limits to Americans. And so I started going on my own. Uh, I think the first time was in 2000, and I would go there for a couple of weeks uh, just to check it out. And I would always go through Mexico. And, and because of my experience then, um, I decided to start developing a script there. And uh, I got a Sundance Sloan Foundation grant in 2008 uh, to write a script set in Cuba. And so I spent about five months there in 2008, 2009, developing the script. And while I was there, I got to know this Russian filmmaker who was also working on a narrative project in Cuba. And he was doing a very controversial piece uh, about this hustler in Cuba. And he was a lot further along than I was and had asked me if I wanted to do a making of his film. And at first I was like, well, I have my own project and you know, I don't know if I have time to do this also. But then I realized it'd be a great way to get to know how a foreigner makes a film in Cuba, um, how, how Cuban crews work, and, and I would really get intimate access to that in preparation for my own film. 
Uh, so a couple years later, when he finally got all the financing ready uh, in the, the fall of 2011, uh, I managed to get a small crew together to go film his pre-production, his production. And sadly, within two weeks of his pre-production, it got totally shut down for many ludicrous reasons. And so we, I was there with the crew. I had a little money from an investor, and I was planning on just coming back to New York and giving the investor their money back. And But then I thought, well, maybe I should stick around for a little while and work on my script, which was constantly evolving because it was, it was very topical in 2008, but two years later, it sort of felt a little outdated. So my crew and I decided to just stick around for a couple more weeks. And, and during that time, we got invited to this random car event uh, where they're actually celebrating the kidnapping of this Formula One legend uh, who had been kidnapped by Castro and his men. And the reason why they celebrate the kidnapping is because he, he helped put the revolution on the map and he ended up becoming a spokesperson for the revolution. And it was, you know, a very monumental series of events that, that helped the revolution actually succeed. At that same event, they announced that they were going to have the first official car race since that time period, and it was going to happen in six weeks. And we just looked at each other and you know, we were awestruck because we had found a film that we could do no problem in six weeks and it'd be you know, a, a typical competition film where we get to know the top racers in Cuba who had been racing illegally for many years um, and we just watched them prepare for this historic race. But welcome to Cuba where a few days before the race, uh, the Pope announced his visit to Cuba and they ended up canceling the race because they said they needed all the barricades that they were going to use for the race for the Pope. And they said, don't worry, you know, it'll be another couple weeks until we reschedule. And so we stuck around and we kept filming with the characters who were, you know, you'd think they would be crestfallen because this monumental race had, ha had been announced and then been canceled. But they're all in their 40s and they've been used to hearing things that are going to happen and don't. And, and, and that's sort of the beauty of their culture, that they have a very different sense of hope than, than we do, um, where they're just, they have the faith that things are going to go their way, but maybe not with the same sense of urgency that, particularly as filmmakers, we want them to go. So they're like, don't worry, it'll happen sometime, just stick around. And, and this was in 2000? At the beginning of 2012. It was supposed to happen in March of 2012. So we stuck around until April of 2012 and filmed with them for about four months and ran out of all of our money. And, uh, and decided to come back to New York because our visas were running out, um, because we only had two month journalist visas there. Um, so we came back and we had you know, 140 hours of footage that we decided to edit so we could raise more money. And with the intention of coming back the second the race was announced again, but then fast forward eight months later and the race still wasn't announced, but they called me on the phone saying, we think it's going to happen in January 2013 and you should come. And, and so I came and when I landed, I was told, well, it's actually been postponed another week or two. And, and I honestly thought it was never going to happen. It was going to have to be like a waiting for Godot story. And, and I was really interested in this theme of, of their idea of hope versus our idea. Um, but then, without revealing too much in the film, somehow they managed to pull it off. And, and I think you know, we, we got this spectacular ending that we, we could have never written, and I'm not going to reveal that. Mm. Um, but once we had that ending, I knew no matter what, we had a film, because it really helped anchor us into the whole story. And, and then we spent, you know, it's 2015 now, so I've been editing for quite a while. Um, and I've never done an ensemble piece, and that was a, a big challenge, because Normally, you know, I, I do love character-driven pieces, and I do love trying to be as observational as possible and let them speak in their own words. Um, but in this case, I had so many rich characters that I, I did have to pick and choose who I was going to focus on. And, and the goal for me was always, you know, if the, if the characters aren't differentiated, then I, I have to either make them minor characters or just cut them out completely, which was tough because I developed relationships with with seven or eight of these guys. You did a beautiful job on that, I have to say. It is a pretty complicated thing to keep all of those characters going and allow us in a short period of time to kind of get up to speed with who they are and remember them throughout the narrative. And I think you just completely you know, nailed that. And, and it makes it really fun to be able to keep going from family to family and car to car and see how they evolve.
Yeah. My question is, how the hell did you guys coordinate with the White House that they were going to be changing the 50-year <laughs> embargo at the same time that you're going to have your world premiere? <laughs> um, who is your publicist, and how does one go about doing that? <laughs> well, we do have a publicist who's based in, in <laughs> D.C., and he does work on a lot of political campaigns, so he pulled a lot of strings. <laughs> no, honestly, I mean, I've never edited a film so long in my life and and I never knew that there was ever going to be an end in sight because with so many characters you know it's a puzzle trying to figure out how to control the pacing how to control who we're emotionally attached to and and also how to keep the story moving forward with this this ending that we knew we had to hit at some point. The second Obama announced this monumental change where for the first time since the revolution there was a sense that Cuba was going to have a normal relationship with the U.S., which I've always been heavily advocating for. And I think I have him to thank over anyone else other than my girlfriend, who had a child while we were doing this whole production. And, uh, and Obama, I mean, not only did he make the announcement right before we were about to submit to Tribeca, and they actually called us the next day saying, drop all other uh, applications. We want it. You know, you can be in competition. Um, but we know it's rough. You think it's, you're going to be ready in time. And, and so we, we were given a very concrete deadline, which we finally hit last week. I mean, I've been editing up until last week. And, and then thank you, Obama, again, because just this week he's announced all these other big momental changes, including taking Cuba off the, the list of terrorists. And so I think it's a great timing for the film. And I do, you know, I was always hoping that something like this would happen, but I, I thought it would be on in much smaller increments. And, and we have this lawyer who is a Cuba specialist, and he was shocked that it happened too. And he said a thousand times, it's a conservative environment. You know, the Congress is never going to pass anything like this. It took him total, by total surprise that Obama was able to maneuver such a radical change in spite of the Congress right now. That, that's great because I, I was wondering about that because I don't, I don't, I'm not an expert on on that region and, and on Cuba. And I was just wondering if you felt that something like this was bubbling up while you were shooting. But it sounds like it was even a surprise to all of you that it happened so quickly and so much in a short period of time. Yeah, I mean, I've been going to Cuba since 2000, and every year, anyone I meet who's only been in Cuba for a week or two, they say, Cuba's going to change soon. Cuba's going to change soon. And really up until 2009 or 2010 did I see any sort of significant changes in Cuba. And those were a result of Raul Castro coming into power, and, and he was much more reform oriented than his brother was and uh, and I knew that if he was making big reforms the US would respond to them and then the whole Alan Grossman thing happened while I was living in Cuba and I knew that that was going to be a very big issue because you know this was Cuba and the US's chance to basically do a, you know a prisoner swap which the US has always had a policy that they don't do prisoner swaps um, but then last year I can't remember where it was, was it in Lebanon? Some, somewhere we did do a, a prisoner swap, which set a precedent that it could be possible in Cuba, but I never thought that it would actually happen. And so there was a, this sort of perfect storm, which ironically, because the Pope is a presence in our film, was orchestrated by the new Pope, who you know, really helped broker the whole deals, which had been going on for 18 months uh, under everyone's radar. And who knows, maybe my lawyer was a part of it, and he's not telling me, but uh, <laughs> he, he's a good actor, if, if uh, uh, if anything. But yeah, I mean, the timing has been really perfect for our film. And I, 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 I complained a lot about how long the edit was taken. But if our film had you know, been released two months ago, it would be a different story or, or four months ago. So I find that with documentaries. I've been on several films where we have wanted to finish sooner and we expected to finish sooner. And it didn't happen that way for various reasons. And then ultimately, something will happen in the news or something will happen in society that actually makes the film more relevant than it would have been if we had made our earlier date. Yeah. So I kind of feel like these things just have their own um, trajectory and their own timelines. And as long as you're working as hard as you can and continuing to move them forward, you know, it all kind of works out and has with your film. One of the themes in the film is about societal inventiveness. And I think you do such a great job of showing us that and not telling it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, when you first hear about my film, it sounds a little cliche because everyone knows Cuba for their old cars and, and, and everyone knows Cuba 
who, who has had a little experience with Cuba, they know that they're very inventive people. To me, the inventiveness was also a telling of change in Cuba because the one thing that you always hear about Cuba is that it's a place stuck in time. You know, just look at those old cars. But if you open the hoods of those cars, there's a thousand different countries involved. There's a thousand different innovative inventions involved. There's a thousand different ways of showing, you know, really showing globalization, really showing Cuba as this dynamic society that because of the blockade or the embargo in the U.S., they haven't been able to, you know, go to a car place and actually get the right part. They create these parts that, you know, that no one could create except these guys because it's by necessity. And, and yes, they use these cars to race, but they also use them to get around town and, and it's their only form of transportation. And a lot of these guys live on the outskirts of Havana where there's no public transportation. So they really depend on these cars for their daily lives. And, uh, and I think the, the, the car as a metaphor for Cuban uh, inventiveness and Cuban perseverance within this this horrible you know embargo um, it, it does show this this fierce Cuban spirit and this Cuban pride that I hope comes out in the film and it was really important to me through these different perspectives to keep you know to keep a focus and a point of view on the beauty of Cuban society and and yes there's a lot of big problems that need to be addressed there, but, but they have a sense of community and a sense of value that doesn't exist here. And they, you know, there's no garbage on the streets because someone can always figure out a, a way to use whatever is discarded. And, and you know, talk about a place that knows how to recycle. I mean, these guys are above none. One of the things about the film that's very compelling is um, how close up we are, like we feel physically very close to them and to the race. You know, you're in the car, you're on the hood of the car. It just, it's, it, you really capture the excitement of, of this world and what's going on. Can you talk a little bit about how you were able to do that? I presume you had a pretty tight budget. How you were able to do that in terms of cameras and audio and, you know, did you use GoPros? What was the technology? Well, another sort of perfect storm was that GoPro had just come out with these great new HD cameras that could actually be used in film rather than just on your home video. And, and so the first trip, we decided to bring two GoPros. And, uh, and at first, it was just going to be to capture you know, out off the hood and get these nice uh, driving shots of Cuba. But then we realized, you know, why not show the emotion of these guys when they're racing with them? And, Sadly, it didn't make it into the film, but there was this one illegal race where we had put a GoPro in one of our characters' cars. And the next thing we know, one of the other characters gets in the car with him and they just race off by themselves. They don't know they're on camera. And it's this pure moment of joy that really captured you know, the excitement these guys feel. And when we saw that footage, we really realized the value of having a tiny camera while they're racing and really getting in their, their head at that moment. Um, and we were so excited about the use of GoPros that we actually approached GoPro as a possible sponsor. And miraculously, they gave us a little cash for the next trip and they gave us 15 cameras to use and, uh, and they've been a sponsor and they're gonna help us promote the film. And wow. so it was a great sort of su uh, success story of finally like succeeding with sponsors who are normally very hard to get, particularly in a place like Cuba where prior to Obama's announcement, a lot of companies didn't want to have anything to do with Cuba. So, wow. so yeah, so we used a lot of GoPros, um, particularly for the race, which allowed us, without revealing anything, if we hadn't had GoPros, it would have not been able to capture the, the, the finale. And, uh, and all the races, in order to film them well, you have to have multiple cameras. And unless you have a huge budget, GoPros are a great way to just put a camera down and push record and not worry about it. It made a huge difference to it. And you could feel that in how you were everywhere. Um, and you were able to capture so many aspects of the, of the races. Yeah, we ended up having 20 cameras at, at one of the races. Yeah, you could totally feel that. I'm sure you have a million stories to talk about some of the challenges of shooting in Cuba when you did. Can you think of one or two that you'd like to share, just a challenge and then how you were able to meet that challenge? Well, when we were doing the original film, the making of film, we had a ton of equipment with us in Cancun. 
and the producers of the, the narrative film, they had said, don't worry, you're going to have no problem getting your equipment in. And while we were in Cancun, I, I got a call, and luckily I picked up, saying, actually, we don't have the permits in place. All of your equipment might get confiscated. Can you just leave it in Cancun? Here's the name of some random person that said you can store all of your stuff. And we had probably $30,000, $40,000 worth of stuff that you shouldn't teach this at Columbia. So we ended up following their orders, going to this random house in Cancun, putting it in a little boy's room, and for eight weeks it was there, and all we had was a, a 5D to, to film the making of. And the biggest reason why it took so long was because of the wireless mics. And the Cuban authorities say that if you bring a wireless mic in, you can, you can scan police monitors. And in general, the paperwork that was done was a very long process. And, and I always tell particularly journalists who are trying to do anything in Cuba, you have to spend at least a few weeks there because with any interviews, they're going to push it back. They're going to you know, cancel it. They're going to say, this is wrong, this is wrong. It's sort of like the race itself being postponed all the time. It's very difficult to get um, things in an efficient way in Cuba because there's such a bureaucratic system. And, and we were very lucky to have gotten actual permits to make the film because you know, we were trying to capture this historic event and the Cuban authorities were fine with it. One hiccup was they said in order for us to do this legally, we had to have one of their employees with them at all times, which we thought was going to be a huge drag because they were going to you know, spy on us or they were going to uh, censor us in ways. But it ended up being great because he was this young 27-year-old who ended up being our co-producer and he had a car so he drove us around and he knew all the racers and so he, you know, he already had a relationship with them and he's actually coming to Tribeca for the screening and, uh, and he's great and he also had a baby during this production too. And so yeah, production, you know, I haven't even started talking about the, the headache of the U.S. side getting permission to shoot in Cuba but from a Cuban side that was definitely the biggest thing, just getting the right paperwork in order and then just getting around Cuba is you know we were we had a driver who had one of these old cars which was definitely not in the same condition that the racers cars were and so we were on the side of the road a lot with that car and and just eating every day there's no such thing as fast food in Cuba so if you want lunch it's like a three-hour endeavor and uh, so we all lost a lot of weight which I guess is a good way of you know going on a diet but you know there's a huge film community there and they the average Cuban I think watches 26 films in the cinema a year Whereas here, it's like the average American watches four or five. So they're very savvy, and we had a great Cuban crew. Um, but there are things like they take their lunches very seriously, and, and it's a long production. And so we had a lot of you know, cultural differences as far as how a film gets produced. What do you think the future is for these racers in particular, and also just the US and Cuba? You talked a little bit about that, but do you have any kind of uh, future forecasting that you see? Well, it's interesting because Sadly, there hasn't been another official race since the one that we were able to film in 2012. And there is a very vibrant car culture there, or car club culture, that holds very small ev events every weekend. And the philosophy of the organizers of the official race is you know, they really want to build up a responsible car culture before they try to have another huge race. But we're hoping you know, that this film can help push the process along faster because the, the reality of the situation is the Ministry of Sports has a certain number of sports that they support. And car racing, even though it's now legal, it's not supported by the Ministry of Sports. So it's still very difficult to have an infrastructure to have a safe race even though there's a very high popular demand for it. So I think a lot of these racers are hopeful that, you know, hopefully also with the film, but more because of this movement with the car clubs, that they will have more official events and that they'll actually somehow be paid for it too because they put all of their resources into these cars and they don't get a penny. I mean, they're not even allowed to get prizes at the races. And you know, there's never considered a winner and a loser because it's a communist society and, and they're all winners because they participate. And, and that's sort of another theme of the film, the paradox of these guys who are fiercely independent through their cars and their racing, but they're also in the society where there's not supposed to be winners and losers and, and definitely not supposed to be gambling, which, which is also very prevalent with the, the racers. But I think, you know, 
on a personal level, one of the guys is still trying to leave Cuba a lot, and obviously he wasn't able to get a visa for this film, but I have a feeling, you know, one day he's just going to knock on my door and, and have made it here. And the guy with cancer, he lost 100 pounds last year because he had gone through 26 new rounds of chemo, and, and he's actually coming to the premiere, which we're very excited about. And then the other two guys, I mean, the sad thing is now with the new... U.S.-Cuba relations, there's a lot more money being poured into Cuba and there are a lot more resources, which means there are a lot faster cars coming into Cuba, including you know brand new Mercedes and BMWs that are competing with these old cars. And so I think we captured a moment in time that is no longer there, unfortunately. But, you know, but these guys are considered the top racers still, so hopefully there will be a space for them and, and hopefully the film will help promote their sport. And then a lot of people have been contacted me about TV shows there based on these guys and, and other sort of spin-offs from the film, which would be exciting. I don't know if I can spend another four years in Cuba. I mean, I would love to, but now I have a new family. But I do want to help these guys out as much as possible, really gain the recognition they deserve, and, and hopefully the film will help that. And do you have plans yet for a screening in Cuba? We're hoping in the next couple of months, because it's really important to me that they get to celebrate as much as we're celebrating here. And we've already had a few screenings in Cuba, just rough cuts to make sure they were happy and comfortable with what we were showing. And that was always a lot of fun because they would invite their families and there'd be you know 150 of all the family members who we'd gotten to know. But it would be really great to have a huge screening there. And, and we want to have a drive-in screening with the old cars there. And the Havana Film Festival had invited us to screen in, in December, but obviously we weren't, we weren't done yet. So you know, at the very least, we'll screen it at the festival there in December. Um, but we do want to have a, a, some, something happen this summer there. You and I are both graduates of the MFA program in film at the School of the Arts at Columbia University. And would you say there's anything that you learned during your time there that impacted the making of this film? Well, I think, you know, you and I are both documentary filmmakers, too. And, and to me, and I don't call myself just a documentary filmmaker because Columbia was very much a narrative-based program. Yeah. And a good story is a good story. And I think, you know, so many people feel like documentaries have to be issue driven and a lot of interviews and a narrator and, and just a whole another genre. Uh, but to me, it was very important for this film to treat it as I would treat writing a script or I would treat directing a narrative in that I have these certain characters who have certain desires who can't fulfill those desires for one reason or another. And, and that's, you know, Columbia 101. And that's what I've always kept from Columbia and, and particularly in all of my documentaries that you obstacle know, and conflict. Yeah, and then a goal that's achieved or not. And uh, you know, the lucky thing about this documentary was we had an ending that I knew the editing would always go towards. And I remember in my writing classes always being taught, you know, figure out your ending before you do too much writing because otherwise it's just going to wander around and, and, and having an ending really anchors your story or your documentary in a way that is very difficult, you know, if you don't know what your ending is. But with that said, be flexible with not knowing your ending before you start shooting. And I think that's the same for writing too. Maybe you have a very clear ending in mind, but that might change as you're writing your script or directing your feature film or capturing your documentary. And it, it certainly changed for us. So, so yeah, no, I, I'm very grateful for the this, this storytelling background that I, I achieved at Columbia. And also the cinematography in a documentary, which a lot of people put on the wayside too. Uh, I had this wonderful, DP from NYU who's very talented and she'd never done a documentary and you know which was challenging because she wasn't used to holding a camera all day long and and, and really getting the the observational uh, approach but she had such a great sense of composition and and really using the image to tell the story rather than hearing these these guys speaking all the time so she was always thinking very visually um, Editing, of course, was essential in this film, and that took years. and And I learned how to edit at Columbia, and I've that's how I make a living. You know, outside of these documentaries, I, I do a lot of editing. So, yeah, I mean, this film wouldn't have been possible without my education at Columbia and and people like you mentoring me. So, thank you very much. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations on Havana Motor Club, and I look forward to uh, the Tribeca premiere. 
Columbia University School of the Arts awards the Master of Fine Arts degree in Film, Theater, Visual Arts, and Writing, and the Master of Arts degree in Film Studies. It also offers an interdisciplinary program in Sound Arts. The school is a thriving, diverse community of artists from around the world with talent, vision, and commitment. The faculty is composed of acclaimed and internationally renowned artists, film and theater directors, writers of poetry, fiction and nonfiction, playwrights, producers, critics, and scholars. Every year, the School of the Arts presents exciting and innovative programs for the public, including performances, exhibitions, screenings, symposia, a film festival, and numerous lectures, readings, panel discussions, and talks with artists, writers, critics, and scholars. This year, the school marks the 50th anniversary of its founding. For more information, visit arts.columbia.edu.